morning. Michael here, looking today at Psalms 22, a psalm subtitled, Why Have You Forsaken Me? And we're looking at verses 6 through 8 for the exposition. And those words reads, verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. Verse 7. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. And verse 8. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. And so we look to the treasure of David then for the exposition. Verse 6. But I am a worm and no man. This verse is a miracle in language. How could the Lord of glory be brought to such abasement as to be not only lower than the angels, but even lower than men? What a contrast between I am and I am a worm. Yet such a double nature was found in the person of our Lord Jesus when bleeding upon the tree. He felt himself to be comparable to a helpless, powerless, downtrodden worm, passive while crushed and unnoticed and despised by those who trod upon him. He selects the weakest of creatures, which is all flesh, and becomes, when trodden upon, wreathing, quivering flesh, utterly devoid of any might except strength to suffer. This was the true likeness of himself when his body and soul had become a mass of misery, the very essence of agony in the dying pangs of crucifixion. Man by nature is but a worm, but our Lord put himself even beneath man on account of the scorn that was heaped upon him and the weakness which he felt, and therefore he adds, and no man. The privileges and blessings which belong to the fathers he could not obtain while deserted by God, and common acts of humanity were not allowed him, for he was rejected of men. He was outlawed from the society of earth and shut out from the smile of heaven. How utterly did the Saviour empty himself of all glory and become of no reputation for our sakes, a reproach of men. Their common but and jest, a byword and a proverb unto them, the sport of the rabble and the scorn of the rulers. Oh, the caustic power of reproach to those who endure it with patience, yet smart under its most painfully, and despised of the people. The vox populi was against him. The very people who would once have crowned him then contempted him. And they who were benefited by his cures sneered at him in his woes. Sin is worthy of all reproach and contempt. And for this reason Jesus, the sin-bearer, was given up to be thus unworthily and shamefully entreated. Verse 7 all they that see me laugh me to scorn. Read the evangelistic narrative of the ridicule endured by the crucified one. And then consider in the light of this expression how it grieved him. The iron entered into his soul. Mockery has for its distinctive description cruel mockings. Those endured by our Lord were of the most cruel kind. The scornful ridicule of our Lord was universal. All sorts of men were unanimous in the derisive laughter and vied with each other in insulting him. Priests and people, Jews and Gentiles, soldiers and civilians, all united in the general scoff, and that at the time when he was prostrate in weakness and ready to die. Which shall we wonder at the most, the cruelty of man or the love of the bleeding Saviour? How can we ever complain of ridicule after this? They shoot out the lip, they shake the head. These were gestures of contempt. 
pounding, grinning, shaking off the head, trusting out of the tongue, and other modes of derision were endured by our patient Lord. Men made faces at him, before whom angels veiled their faces and the door. The basest signs of disgrace which disdain could devise were maliciously cast at him. They punned upon his prayers, they made matter for laughter of his suffering, and set him utterly at naught. Herbert sings of our Lord as saying, Shame tears my soul, my body many a wound. Sharp nails pierce this, but sharper than confound. Reproaches which are free while I am bound, was ever grief like mine. Verse 8 Saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Here the taunt is cruelly aimed at the sufferer's faith in God, which is the tenderest point in a good man's soul, the very apple of his eye. They must have learned the diabolical art from Satan himself, for they made rare proficiency in it. According to Matthew 27, 39 to 44, there were five forms of taunt hurled at the Lord Jesus. This special piece of mockery is probably mentioned in this psalm because it is the most bitter of the whole. It has a biting, sarcastic irony in it, which gives it a peculiar venom. It must have stung the man of sorrows to the quick. When we are tormented in the same manner, let us remember him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, and we shall be comforted. On reading these verses, one is ready with trap to ask, Is this a prophecy or a history? For the description is so accurate. We must not lose sight of the truth which are unwittingly uttered by the Jewish scoffers. They themselves are witnesses that Jesus of Nazareth trusteth in God. Why then was he permitted to perish? Jehovah had a forced time, delivered those who rolled their burdens up on him. Why was this man deserted? Oh, that they understood the answer. Note further that their ironical jest, seeing it del he delighted in him, was true. The Lord did delight in his dear son, and when he was found in fashion as a man and became obedient unto death, he still was well pleased with him. Strange mixture. Jehovah delights in him and yet bruises him, is well pleased and yet slays him. Heavy indeed. Trust you enjoyed the meditation. God in all his glory watched as his son sacrificed himself for you and me and bore the sins in his body. Well, Michael here declaring yet again Jesus is Lord. Until next time. Be blessed.